well. So some fast facts are um, that Radio frequency radiation can damage biology at very low intensity or so-called non-thermal exposures. There are no current UK safety limits to protect against that kind of damage. We currently use the ICNIRP limits, but these were only designed to protect against very short exposures and above thermal heating levels. They do not protect and were never designed to protect against non-thermal low intensity exposures and particularly for prolonged periods. Biological disruption is not linearly proportional to either intensity or frequency. This is a really important take home fact. I'm going to wind back the clock for a moment to the 70s, where smoking was frightfully good for you, don't you know? Even we, we all told society this, even medical doctors. But we had some really important papers published at that time, really stemming back from the 50s, but more prolific in the 70s, from really credible groups like this uh, military research group and they found a variety of very important factors. Biological effects were dependent on, we've mentioned frequency, but also polarization of fields. Most natural fields are not polarized and most man-made fields are. And of course the characteristics of the biological absorbing tissue, um, reflection and sort of real life 3D effects, and these uh, frequency and amplitude windows. This is connecting with uh, the non-linearity of this phenomenon. So you can have lower intensities of radiation, that can cause enhanced biological damage. And uh, Leif Sorford's work on rats' brains and albumin leakage is really good to understand this a little better. So they noticed these low intensity effects, but also issues with calcium handling, DNA damage, alteration growth rates of certain types of cells, uh, variable sensitivity le levels of different organisms, very important. And central nervous system effects predominating which we see again and again in the literature. And they point out that some of the frequencies that seem to be maximally interactive coincide with brainwave frequencies. So when all this great work was done back in the 70s, how did this happen? This huge proliferation in microwave technologies that's somewhat exponential. We've already covered these points, but to mention a couple more that I think are really important, cumulative exposure, what kind of signal is being emitted, whether it's intermittent or continuous, whether it's pulse modulated or a sine wave, and um, electromagnetic field and chemical synergy. Very important in real life situations because it's all very well doing lots of experiments in the lab, but they often bear no resemblance to the real life uh, absorption characteristics that we face. So synergy, as mentioned by Fiorella Balpoggi this morning, I think is really important. We see enhanced effects when different types of waves, so ELF is combined, for example, with ionizing radiation or radio frequency. But also, we've, we can show that RF uh, can be considered in some situations a co-carcinogen when it's in reacting with other chemical stressors. And of course, in a room, such as a classroom, you've got a reflection of fields and interference from multiple dev devices where you have the possibilities for um, constructive or destructive interference, creating hot spots in the room or even within a child's body that are totally unpredictable, that we can't measure, that will change continuously. And there are vulnerabilities. So you guys and the, and the children we're here to discuss are not like the routers that came off the production line. They have individual vulnerabilities that may vary according to their age, sex, sensitivity level, and comorbidity. So to talk about children particularly, their skulls are thinner, which offers less shielding to the delicate brain tissue beneath. Neonates in particular will have a higher water content that can make them far more efficient microwave absorbers. They're physically smaller, of course, so they're more fully enveloped by these fields. And all of their systems are still developing. And we know stem cells in particular are exquisitely sensitive to this kind of radiation. And of course, they have a longer time ahead of them for the latent effects. We know there can be decades from exposure to manifestation, particularly in carcinogenesis. And for the first time, really, we have a generation now that are exposed in utero from conception. <laughs> 